Can, can I put it on? <laughs> I certainly can. You want my shirt too? <laughs> Is that um, the more we study the cosmos scientifically in terms of physics and cosmology, particularly now, and look at how finely tuned the constants, uh, the mathematical constants of the universe are in terms of the total quantity of mass, for instance, or, or and the relationship of gravity to uh, to mass and its role in the formation or organization of matter. <coughs> we see that were things infinitesimally different in the beginning, uh, there wouldn't have been planets, for instance, that could hold life, and there certainly wouldn't be humans that could arise to come up with a new story of the universe. And this has suggested to some people that built into the very structure of the cosmos is a kind of intention that what the cosmos is about, in a sense, at least in the very late phases of the story where we are now, is about making us so that we can tell the story. So you see a kind of a loop, a looping back to the beginning, where what was implicit at the beginning is becoming uh, manifest or actualized. So that gives us a little hint also about what the nature of the human might be. It's a fascinating principle. So, will you say something more about that? Because I don't have a handle on, on the constants. Could you give some good examples of, uh, of that, I hope? And we're going to get into areas of disagreement, right? Well, we may not disagree. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Okay. So, I'd, I'd like to talk Sean, about that. question. Yes. Great. <laughs> All right. So, looking... I'm not a scientist. I, I love science, but I have no formal scientific training. Um, but I do have some philosophical training. And I wanted to share with you a couple of um, philosophical, not jewels, at least finely painted pebbles uh, that you find on the beach of philosophy. And one of them is from uh, Schelling, who was alive around the time of the uh, French Revolution. He was a genius, very, very young, uh, brilliant man. And he said that nature, or the cosmos, is slumbering spirit that that's what the cosmos is. So I, we've gone from talking about trying to get a handle of what the human is for a second to go, go to the cosmos. So what nature of the cosmos is, is slumbering the spirit. And what spirit? Well, we might say that spirit is what we are, or what we can be if, if we really actualize our potential, which is awake and self-conscious and able to tell really good stories. Right? That's what spirit is. Mm -hmm. So nature is, is spirit, but it's spirit asleep. And what the human is, therefore, is awakened nature. So there's a, a kind of yin-yang reciprocity between uh, cosmos and psyche, or, or um, nature and spirit, or nature and the human. That's really beautiful. I find that's, that's so beautiful. <coughs> Obviously, though, it strikes me, we're not really that awake. Or if we're awake, we're sort of in a hypnopompic state. We're, we're just waking up. We're falling in and out of sleep. We're dreaming most of the time. Uh, subject to night terror, sleepwalking, and so on. But it gives us, I think, uh, a hint or some, uh, some way of, uh, of getting at maybe what the role of the human is. Okay. So we are the cosmos, but we're the cosmos waking up. Then there's Nietzsche. So if you go about 100 years later than uh, Schelling, so about 100 years after the French Revolution, back to the human now, not to nature. Nietzsche said, the human is a bridge, not a goal. And the human is a bridge, <coughs> not a goal. He also said, the human is something that must be overcome. Let's, we take those two together. And not only that the human is something that must be overcome, but what the human is, its essence, in a sense, is self-overcoming. So what it means to be human is that we are a bridge. So now we've gone from this, this um, Schelling's view of um, nature and spirit and a kind of um, mandalic yin-yang picture to a really forward-moving evolutionary uh, sense, which you do, you do have in Schelling as well. So the human is something that must be overcome. The human is, not, is, is a bridge, not a goal. But then the question is, a bridge to what? Right. What is the goal? And we could go back to Schelling, we could go to, to the Buddha, uh, could go to the East and say that the goal is awakening, is full, full awakening. But what it would be like 
to be full of it without any wood green anymore. I'm not sure what that would look like, but you can look at that. And uh, the last one I'll, I'll uh, bring up here <coughs> is uh, Sri Aurobindo. See, uh, Nietzsche spoke of the overman, right, or the overhuman, the ubermensch, which is not the superman. It's been badly translated as the superman. <coughs> but it's really this idea of, of um, uh, what distinguishes the human nature from other natures, other animals, let's say, is that it's a nature that is unfinished, that we're, we're like, and our distinctive, um, what's distinctive about our nature is that it's serving to birth something that is, um, that precedes it and is calling it forward beyond itself. Now, Sri Aurobindo talked about the supermind and the supermental. He also talked about the overmind, and he saw that uh, we do have a goal, Human, the cosmic evolutionary process does have a goal, and that goal is to awaken to its true nature as sat, shit, ananda, right? Existence or being, consciousness, bliss. And you could spend a lot of time just meditating on what that means: being, <coughs> consciousness, bliss. You could also think in, in in more Western terms, Christian terms, for instance, about love, realizing love, and meaning, truth, justice beauty, so more traditional philosophical terms. So I don't have an answer, but uh, what I want to leave, leave us with that we can explore a bit further is this notion that, um, uh, well, maybe I do want to finish with um, this little paragraph from Pico, Mirandola, I'm not sure, but it's, uh, are there any Italians here? It's the correct way of pronouncing it. Pico de la Mirandola? No, we don't know where the stress, Mirandola, where were the stress group? Mirandola. Okay. All right. Well, let me let me finish with this. Some of you may know this this um, story. Pico, uh, we're back at the Renaissance now, and he wrote this uh, um, oration on the dignity of the human, where he tried to uh, get a handle on what is distinctive about the human in the cosmos. And he told the story of how uh, the Creator after having created basically a perfect cosmos where there, was, there were no spaces, no breaks, everything was complete, but there was nobody else to enjoy it. And he thought of creating a special being, the human, who would be able to admire, reflect upon, and praise this creation. But he had uh, the creator, also he, he speaks of a he, but he, the, the creator of the God, the Godhead had no more archetypes left, no more patterns to create anything new. So he decided to make this being participate in the natures, all of the other existing natures, so that the human is a kind of chameleon, doesn't have a proper nature. And this is what he told uh, the first human. You, who are confined by no limits, sh shall determine for yourself your own nature. I have set you at the center of the world so that from there you may more easily survey whatever is in the world. We have made you neither heavenly nor earthly, neither mortal nor immortal, so that more freely and more honorably the molder and maker of yourself, you may fashion yourself in whatever form you shall prefer. Who then will not wonder at this chameleon of ours, or who could wonder more greatly at anything else? So the question I leave you with is, what is it that we want to fashion ourselves into? Because we're at a critical moment now where uh, the world needs to be remade. Um, and uh, we have that as our nature, as our calling, to <coughs> remake ourselves. And I've thrown out some, some uh, ideas from the past, but I'd like us to explore that. And I'd like to see what you have. To say, because with Pico, we come back to this uh, an earlier version of the uh, anthropic cosmological principle, where the human is at the center of the cosmos. In a sense, everything depends on the human in this in this way of thinking, and that's that's a position I would argue. So I'm, it's a radical anthropocentrism. Maybe that's where we can disagree. With it. You know, what I've noticed sometimes when we have discussions. Mm -hmm. um, the general discussion focuses on the person who went second. You ever notice that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I thought it might be good to open up. Like, now we have a little bit of, I just, uh -huh. Sure. Can I get a shot? Let's do that. Yeah.
There may be some need for clarification. Yeah, why do you want to come and see? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll be part of the discussion. We just need to open up. Oh, oh, open up. No, right, because otherwise, we'll <laughs> forget everything you said. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Nobody watch. I'm not worried about that. I thought you meant, no, 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 no. Let's go. Let's, let's, uh, let's yeah. have you. I'm, I'm serious. I'm serious. But right now, there may be some points of clarification. Well, oh, that's true. Yeah. Points of clarification. Ed. Let's let's do that. But then we've got to put him on the hot seat. Oh, yeah, definitely. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Really issues. Sean, I, I, I don't disagree that there's a, there's a certain amount of, of fashioning of ourselves, but I guess I would also want to recognize um, the other part, the parts of nature that we do participate in. I mean, certainly we are part of life, um, the life world. Um, we are certainly part of, of an emotional world of, of mammals and uh, the sensitivity of mammals and, and so on. And, um, and we participate in a mental world of Again, I would say other creatures do as well. Um, is a certain amount of owning of of those aspects of ourselves that we are that we in this overcoming this overcoming we often want to get rid of and, and, and deny. I mean, we are sexual beings. You know, we are spiritual beings as well. Um, so recognizing that full spectrum of of, this, of the right. the human. Right, but ducks are ducks are sexual beings, right? Lions are sexual beings. So what is it that's distinctive about the human? Right, I'm not arguing that it's it's this this claim about being a chameleon and being able to fashion ourselves as anything that we are. We are. I see. I see. So there are constraints. Right. There are constraints. We right. are sexual beings. Yeah. We are blood and flesh. We are the cosmos. We are the cosmos. Right. right. I mean, so it's not like we aren't. No, we are the cosmos. Yeah, I agree. But the question is, how? What? Uh, we are the cosmos, but we're the cosmos in a different way. That primates are the cosmos, or the ducks are the, are the cosmos, or the roses are the cosmos. <laughs> so this is what I'm trying to get at. What we are the cosmos. So by saying, by d defining that specificity, we're not removing ourselves from the cosmos. What we're doing is we're revealing a depth to the cosmos. Right. Mm -hmm. So my argument would be rather than cosmos as fixed pattern, we're cosmos as as more of an open pattern, but we're still cosmos. Yes, I agree fully. Yeah. Uh, Darcy and then. <laughs> Um, coming from like a deep ecology background, you know the the whole thread of and thrust of environmental philosophy um, <coughs> since well, like Rachel Carson's Silent Spring and um, a number of seminal works pointing to the biblical creation story that placed humanity at the pinnacle of existence have been indicted as the primary cause of. Uh, humans destruction of natural ecosystems um, so anthropocentrism is a dirty word to most right. environmentalists yeah. uh, or ecological thinkers mm. so I'm just wondering how you feel about putting forth a radical anthropocentric view in the context of a human society that so desperately, it seems, needs to be disidentifying with themselves as being the center of creation and starting to tune into participatory right. reality. Well, two things. I, I, I said radical anthropocentrism partially to try to bait Brian. If I probably would have said like a complex anthropocentrism rather than, than a radical one. But nevertheless, uh, I do think that a, that a radical, deep ecological, non sort of anti anthropocentric view is incoherent, uh, simply because it, it is well. Let's see, it begs the question, right? To to not even even just take the the situation on this earth where uh, clearly the threat to the ecosystem that deep ecology is trying to respond to is by their own uh, uh, analysis, a product of human agency, right? So humans are certainly uh, first in a kind of destructive power over the ecosystem. And that seems to confirm the biblical description that, uh, that the humans have this dominion. It's just an abused dominion. It's, it's a, uh, it hasn't been properly managed. And clearly the, the other side, in terms of knowledge, uh, the naming, Humans are 
the only animals that we can, that perhaps dolphins have names for things, we don't know. Uh, it's quite possible. Um, but given the link between knowledge and power, I, I would bet that humans um, happen to be that part of the cosmos where the naming or the knowing and the power reach a critical threshold and in that sense uh, uh, become the center. We are the center right now and it, by not acknowledging that we are the center I think we risk uh, global devastation. I mean it's already happening but um, it, it won't do to my mind to abdicate the central position that we hold. It could be argued that we're central to the Earth, but then what about life on other planets? Well, that's fascinating. I'd say wherever you have the cosmos awakening to itself so that it can destroy an ecosystem and more positively tell a story of the universe, there you have the human. So I think that the, the <laughs> that is the human. So um, that's how we define the human. So the human defined as self-reflexive. Self-reflexive, yeah, in that sense. So the human species, in that sense, is probably disseminated across the universe, and they're destroyed everything inside. No, so <laughs> I would say some of them have probably succeeded. There are probably garden planets of, of model, model harmonious relations between uh, uh, our species and ecosystems and other planets that have perished because their suns have died, and you know, uh, millions of years ago, tens of thousands and millions of years ago, and there are others that will be born after our sun is dead, right? This planet is doomed. You know, even if we get our, our act together, uh, the, the, earth, the earth and the sun, the whole solar system is doomed. But the human, the human, uh, that's not the end of the human, because wherever there is self-reflexive cosmos, there is human. Otto, could you pass the wine around right now? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, I, I'm sorry, this, uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. I believe the, the, universe, the universe is what we are. I do believe that. And, um, and I also reflect on the fact that there is an objective universe which is born with, in, with each one of us, and that there is an unmanifested universe that perhaps spills through our dreams by being the homo dreamer instead of the homo, of homo sapiens. Mm. I think that that division is part of the paradox that we, we try to solve or we try to integrate. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I see that duality. It's like there is that, that objective universe that I'm born into, which is me, because it reflects back to me. And so it becomes a mirror in my relationship world, in, in the cosmic uh, world, but also the in manifested universe, which is where I go when I'm, when I'm dying. That I'm not, I'm not conscious about or objective about in the way that I am right now. And um, what's, what's happening with that universe? Mm. Wow, yeah, that's, that's deep. First of all, yeah, um, but you also are the mirror of the cosmos. So the cosmos is not only our mirror, but you are you are the mirror of the cosmos, right? Yeah. And, um, That's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. That shows me my responsibility. I don't know what to say about all these other worlds. It just shows us how vast the cosmos is, not only spatially but dimensionally. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's too bad. Is Robert? <coughs> There he is. Yeah, Robert can say more about these other realms. Knowing and talking are not the same. Autumn, Barry, Mark, and then, then we've got to get Brian in. Okay, so, actually. A very brief question, okay. just a clarification. When you say human, do you mean the bipedal mammalian? Mm. Um, no, what I mean by human is uh, when the cosmos awakens to itself as cosmos, right? That's what the human is. The sapiens and homo sapiens, the sapiens is awakening. Potentially, it's also demons. It's insanity, right? Homo sapiens demons. And, and uh, the, the, the positive part of the demons is that we dream and we're creative and imaginal, but the shadow side is that we're insane. So homo sapiens demons 
but wherever you have that awakening, that's that's uh, that's the human. Uh, so, so I can imagine a different genetic makeup that would allow for that to happen. That just so happens that here, that's the one that we have that has allowed that to happen. But it's not necessarily limited to to this particular genetic makeup. So it could be true that dolphins are humans too. It could be. Yeah, if we discover <laughs> they have, if, if we if we suddenly or one day discover that they have their version of the story of the universe, we would finally recognize them as uh, fellow humans. Uh, sorry, now uh, Mark, and I really want to get Brian in here. Though. Um, well, maybe this is a transition to Brian. I, it was first really brought home to me that um, humans are a global phenomenon in Brian's classes and. The question that you're leaving us with, which is, what is it that we want to fashion ourselves into, seems to me like it might potentially bridge both of what both of you may be saying. Because if we are a global phenomenon, then um, that that is the essential question that we have to ask and answer. And um, and wouldn't that question fit just as neatly into the perspective that you're presenting as the perspective that Brian presents? Yeah, although I want to see what this perspective he's going to present tonight. Yeah, <laughs> he's changed his mind. I know, he's changed for the last couple of years. He's a comedian. A comedian? A comedian. He's a comedian. He's a comedian. He's fashioning um, I know there were other hands up. Could we, could we um, I just want to get Brian in here. Yes. I, I, I'm feeling, well, my mind's really quick, and it's it nice to be exactly what you're talking about. Real quick. Uh, this question, or this, uh, contradiction between humanism and its challenge now centered in psychology came up in our organic philosophy class, and I'll repeat for you my thought then. There may be another alternative. And in fact, it's interesting, you said that they may be human, animals may be human, their dolphins are human, so wherever human is, wherever self reflected consciousness, there's human. There's an esoteric idea this esoteric idea, as far as I've found it, exists in the Western tradition and primarily in the Kabbalistic tradition is the primal man, the Adam Kadma. Mm -hmm. It comes through Jakob Berma, William Blake, and then finally Emerson. Shot yeah. the, table <coughs> the idea is that the human existed before right. everything. It was always there. Mm -hmm. And for William Blake, the, the animal kingdom, nature, is another face of humanity to it is human. Okay? It's Swedenborg's the human form divine. Now, this is not Renaissance humanism and its evolution into modern Western culture. This is, some have called it a cosmic humanism. It does not favor human over, it isn't a hierarchical thing. That's beautiful. So that's a, there's, I'm wondering if that's, I've never heard anybody talk about that there's an alternative. But it's always seemed to me that that should be investigated as an alternative, because it's very close to what you're saying. And yes, in Blake's sense, a dolphin can be a human. Yeah. So because, as Blake said, nature is imagination. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, that's, thank you for that. <coughs> Well, I want to thank my esteemed colleague <laughs> from the philosophy department <laughs> for giving us a survey of what all the dead white guys think. <laughs> and now we go for the live white guys. <laughs> That's part of the whole program. I'm going to have a few people ignorant of what I'm doing here. I'm going to kind of blend, you know. Total knowledge is not the goal. <laughs> well, um, you know, that was fun, but now we're going to get down to the truth, <laughs> because I am a scientist, <laughs> and all this wishful thinking, <laughs> you know, if I am... Um, <clears throat> If I pick up a bunch of um, soil on my hands and I, I can actually measure it, not speculate about it, weigh <laughs> <laughs> it and stuff, I can find out how how much um, how many um, you know atoms and molecules are there, and then how many ultimately uh, protons 
and I'm going to let my hand like this. So, and then I, I multiply out, and I find out actually what the mass of the, the planet Earth is. Notice I'm staying with stuff I know a lot about. <laughs> <laughs> so we can calculate the mass of the planet Earth. And then we also, we know how far away we're, we are from the sun, and so we can figure out the mass of the, of the sun. You know, you got it? In other words, like, we know, uh, according to gravitation, that if it's really, oh yeah, I forgot. I want to do the philosophical part of my talk first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the title of this talk was actually uh, invented by Sean. And I just think it's worthwhile to stop just for a second to reflect on this fact. <clears throat> There's almost nothing more important to think about than the role of the human. For the reasons Sean was saying. I mean, at this time, there's this massive destruction being carried out. And largely it's being carried out by um, agents, humans, who are, who are energized by an inadequate view of themselves and the universe. And it's just worth stopping and reflecting on that. Now, there's different ways of talking about humans. And you know, so from a biological point of view, you know, you did a heavy diss on the genome project, which it deserves, but, but at least from the biological point of view, the, the distinguishing characteristic of a human is the following. Humans are capable of reinventing themselves at the species level. <coughs> the only creature that can do this. We're the only creature, I'm not, I'm not proud of it, but I'm saying we're the only creature that can actually go through a speciation event and still remain the same species. Other, other creatures, when they, when they speciate, they become a new species. That's the difference. And what leads to a speciation event? Complex question. But this question of what the role of the human is, is central now for the, a possible speciation event we're part of. So anyway, regardless of what we come up with here and so forth, I think it's, it's important to realize that um, you know, if we had a national agenda, or an international agenda, but, uh, what's really, really important, at the top I put the question, what is the role of the human? The role, the meaning, the purpose, the function, those are the questions. Okay, now back to the soil. All right, so we have, um, we can figure out the, the main thing, Kim. Can we have some questions back here about what a speciation is? Okay, you have, um, you have uh, you know, four billion years ago, you have the birth of life, and they are, they are, of course, who am I talking to? <laughs> okay, just... A bunch of us. Okay, yeah. a bunch of us, all right. Yeah. So, four billion years ago, we have, um, we, have the first, we have the first forms of life. They're this big. Right. Nice. And then they, and they evolve and change and become um, trees, and they become salmon, and they become grass. So every time there's a change that results in a fundamentally different form, we call it a new species, or I'm, I'm calling it a speciation event. Any other rhetorical questions, Kim? <laughs> well, you said that a human was the only species that could go through a speciation event and remain the same okay. species. So then, so what? The confusion coming yeah, the confusion in. then it would be. He's not a philosopher, right? So that's why. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> They're even. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I'm down too. <laughs> He's got something coming. <laughs> so, so then the question is, that then, and so when I say the human has gone through the speciation events, that would be a, um, that would be kind of, um, I hate to say, the philosophical <laughs> conclusion. But it would be fundamentally look at the species if it alters its relationships within the ecosystem in a, in a, in a fundamental way. We're talking about a new species, and so the humans have gone through. You know, a number of, of fundamental changes that you learn about if you take Sean and David's class on evolution of consciousness. But um, I'm, I'm just sort of thinking of, of the, how different it was when we lived as hunter gatherers and then we settled down. You're like, wow, that's a really different, that's like going from being a salmon to being a uh, tomato plant, you know? Like you're going all over the place and suddenly there, there you are, you're just rooted in one spot. Really, really different. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the dirt. All right, so I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a, a feel for things that really get me excited. 
we can, we can measure how massive the sun is. We can measure how massive the sun is because we can see how fast we're going around. The sun may be the only one interested in this. <laughs> but, all right, so then we can figure out, we can figure out, whoa, there are 10 to the 57, 10 to the 57 elementary particles in the sun. That's awesome. I mean, first of all, just to know it is a thrill. I mean, like, like wow, isn't that a thrill? So? That's, 10, that's what's at 100 with 57 zeros after? Or is it like it's like 1 with 57 zeros. Oh, okay. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, okay, that's great. And then, so then you find out, um, you know, in the, in the Milky Way galaxy, <coughs> so then we have, you go outside and you see the Milky Way galaxy? Yeah. Did y'all see your walk over here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing. We're going to talk about amazing. amazing. What's even more amazing is that I can count the number of stars there. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> there's the experience of the Milky Way, and then there's the counting of the stars. <laughs> and so we can count the number of stars, and there are approximately 50 billion. 100 billion. 100 billion. Let's say, let's say 100 billion. Yeah, 100 billion. So 100, uh, 100 is 10 to the second times a billion is 10 to the ninth. Okay, now we've got the number of elementary particles in the Milky Way galaxy. Next. We, with Hubble Space Telescope and stuff, we can count the number of galaxies in the universe. Whoa. Because we can see all the way back to the beginning of time, and you very carefully count them all up, and you can write down they're around a trillion galaxies. I mean, geez, a trillion galaxies, that's 10 to 12. <laughs> all right? <laughs> I mean, you know, I just. <sighs> so you multiply this all out, and you get out of sec. I need to reduce the. 57, 59, uh, 68, uh, 80. So it's 10 to the 80th. Mm -hmm. All right? That's a number you can take home, you can walk around with. <laughs> you know, after all those horrible things you were saying about the human, <laughs> this is something we know. Whoa, 10 to the 80th. Okay, so, um, something else. If you, if you actually measure, we can measure. So that, now you look around, and you, um, you try to figure out how things are happening. And you, you look at things carefully, and you see that um, there are fundamental ways in which the universe makes things happen. The four fundamental physical interactions. Gravitational, electricity, then you have these two weird ones. There's, they're both nuclear. They have the weak nuclear and the strong nuclear. That's how everything happens in the universe. You know? Now, as soon as I say that, I think, oh, and I'm depressing everybody because they want me to talk about God and spirit and everything else. Well, maybe this is God. Maybe this is spirit. I'm just telling you, when you look, this is what you find. These are the powers. Okay, and then um, being scientists, once we identify the powers, the next thing we always do is measure them. <laughs> that's, that's all we do really well, okay? Just <laughs> measure. So you measure the um, measure the, the strength of the electromagnetic interaction, measure it, and you uh, compare it to the strength of the gravitational interaction, and it's around 10 to the 40th. Um, now, it was, it was Paul Dirac who first saw this, and he said, this is weird. You don't have big numbers like this showing up on a regular basis. Because see, if you call this number here, the number of particles in the universe n, then um, n is like 10 to the 40th uh, squared. The electromagnetic to the gravitational is 10 to the 40th. So this is the, this is what Charles referred to as the anthropic principle. <coughs> Dirac's conclusion was, it's not coincidental. These are our little, little insights into a deep structure of the universe. Right, right. So touching upon deep, deep order of the universe. Dirac didn't know how to explain it. Um, you know, I was involved in graduate school with a little bit of research trying to you know, prove this is actually ongoing. But here, the next one is the one that is, is most remarkable, and that's really the main point I want to make, okay? Going back to what you're talking about. Okay, the various things you can look at in the universe. Another one is this, how old is the universe? So I talked about electromagnetic interaction and so forth. How old is the universe? The universe is something like 13 billion years old. Um, those of you that have heard this and have never and have always sort of wondered how we came up with this number, I'm going to now tell you the secret. All right, 
it's hard to believe, but here is the secret. If you've never heard this before, and if you don't love this, when I'm done telling you, join a philosophy department. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me, but the meaning of my life will evaporate before our eyes. If you look at the universe, like the, the Milky Way galaxy and so forth, if you look at the galaxies that are, that are further away, they are all expanding away from us. This was discovered in the 20th century in the state of California on Mount Wilson. I was just down there last week. I was in the observatory that Edwin Hubble uh, used to see the expansion of the universe. And the, um, even the night watchman let me touch the chair, he said. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd be asking too much if I asked to sit at it. Because <laughs> they've preserved it since 1924, okay? Anyway, okay. So, we discovered the universe expanding, but the amazing thing is if you just, if you look at that expansion, things that are further away are expanding faster. So if they're 10 times as far away, they're expanding 10 times as fast. They're all going like this. And so you just ask yourself, how long did it take for them to get there? It's around 13 billion years. So 13 billion years, everything was in one spot, and it went out like that. But the amazing point here is that the mathematics that's used is, is what we use in sixth grade um, arithmetic. Distance equals rate times time. You find out how far away the galaxies are. You find out how fast they're moving. Distance equals rate times time. Okay, you got what you got. You got distance, you got rate. You figure out time. 13 billion years. Amazing. Here's the problem. The word is year. That's not very scientific. Because what's a year five billion years ago? <laughs> Uh-huh, I never thought of that. <laughs> Five million years ago, but there's no year. Okay, that's the kind of concept you'd use in a philosophy department. <laughs> Science. We want to have something that's fundamental to the universe. So the, 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 the uh, basic unit of time is how long it takes light to go across an elementary particle, a proton. Okay, and that is called a jiffy. <laughs> that was a funny word, but that's right. Right. I, right. maybe other people don't get. But I don't get why there's no year uh, five billion years ago. So no wait, 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 wait! Back to the Socratic method here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what is a year? Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> that's a pedagogical yeah. process we use at PCC. <laughs> Delivering the news. We brought out. It was very quick. Okay. Sorry, Sean, I was going to say a philosopher would have gotten that. <laughs> okay. Okay, so in, if you measure the universe in, in the actual um, nuclear, nuclear, nuclear units of time, it turns out time of the universe is. 10 to the 40th, baby. Yeah. <laughs> wow. yeah. 10 to the 40th. But only 10 to the 40th. Hey, hey, no. Sorry. Right. No, no, no. I hear that part. Only now. Maybe. Yes. Now. That's the point. See, you went from the bottom of the class to the top. <laughs> Just like that. That's good. That's the cool thing. Look at the number of particles in the universe. That's constant. The strength of the electromagnetic interaction of the gravitational, that's constant. But time, that's not constant, that's changing. So in other words, then when, when, when uh, Dirac publishes stuff, everyone went, oh, these aren't even symmetrical, what's going on here? And then, so then what, what do you do with that? You're like, well, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, a physicist at Princeton came up with an awesome interpretation. He said, this isn't some arbitrary time. So for instance, he, said, he says, you couldn't, have, you couldn't have written down 10 to the, um, uh, 34th. Now, 10 to the 34th, look, I know this, the exponential stuff is, is a little bit of a pain for some of you, but just go with it. 10 to the 34th is 1 millionth of 10 to the 40th. Because he is like six exponents right. lower. So it's a millionth. In other words, to write down 10, 10 say you discovered 10 to the 34th, that would mean the universe wasn't 13 billion years old, it was a millionth of 13 billion years old, all right? 
which is, let's see, 13, uh, like 13,000, 13,000 13, years old. So the Bible was right. <laughs> uh, you know, you're not supposed to give away the punchline. <laughs> I really a creationist. <laughs> so look, at 13,000 13, years, the universe consisted of just plasma, protons, neutrons, electrons, that's it. There wasn't a single atom in the universe at 13,000 years. Okay, how about 10 to 35th? That's 130,000 years. At 130,000 years, you did have atoms, but that's it. You didn't have a galaxy. You see the point? Okay, we'll open up at 10 to 36th. Right. The universe required all of this time to develop the complexity that we're talking about existing now. And so Robert Dickey at Princeton said this, you couldn't have discovered this time. This is not an arbitrary time. This is the time when the universe awakened to itself. And it couldn't have happened earlier. Even to be 10 to the 29th would mean that the universe is, is 1.3 billion years old. In other words, it's a tenth of our, of our time right now. 39. 39. 39. 10 to the 39th, it's 1.3 billion years old. You'd have just the beginning of galaxies. You wouldn't even have complex stars at that point. Okay. So what's the interpretation? Now, so scientists, we're good at measuring. We throw it out there. No, what's the interpretation? So here's an interpretation. The... So this, is, this interpretation is coming from uh, Freeman Dyson, Dance Institute you know, uh, physicist. He said this, the universe in some sense must have known we were coming. And, the, and that the, the power of conscious self-reflection, you see, which is what enables all this, that power is as fundamental to the universe as the electromagnetic interaction, as the gravitational interaction, as the number of, of, um, of particles in the universe. That's the interpretation of, of Freeman Dyson. My, the way I like to think about it is that the, it's not the human. I, I'd like to move away from that word a little bit. It's conscious self-awareness. That conscious self-awareness, <coughs> in this sense, is as inevitable to the unfolding of the universe as our stars. So. I'm still not convinced that 10 to the 40th is a <coughs> number because, what, like, how does that relate to 10 to the 80th? Because I watched you do that math and it was based on the mass of our galaxy and then extrapolating it to all others, but without acknowledging that there's mass in the space between galaxies. All yeah. that stuff. I'm just confused about math. Okay. Okay. First of all. And why it's significant. Why 10 to the 40th is significant. It's as related to the mass of the universe. Well, this is the, this is the baryon count. So this is, we're just talking about um, baryons. So this is an estimate of the number of baryons in the universe. Could have been anything. And what Dirac is just saying is, you know, when you have this kind of, you have this kind of um, coherence showing up, look, <clears throat> we can't see the strong nuclear interaction. No one can see it. We can't see the weak nuclear. We can't see the gravitational interaction. We see phenomena. And we notice uh, similarities and patterns. And then we speak out this thing, strong nuclear. That's the, that's the great power of the human imagination. So this is the, the fact that the number shows up here, and it's the same number. You know, there'd be, uh, there'd be 25 different examples of where this number, the large number hypothesis, because this large number 10 to the 40th, shows up. So then what do you do? So what you do is you, you try to come up with uh, an idea that shows the coherence. And the, the idea that uh, Dirac and Dickey and others, uh, Freeman Dyson are working with, is that there is a, there's a coherence in the universe that actually includes the human, or conscious self-awareness. Conscious self-awareness. That's, that's the main point. Now, um, I'm just going to jump from this to my conclusion. I think I did enough on this. Um,
you know, to me, it, there's a difficulty with, with even talking about the word anthropocentrism, because it, it's kind of, um, end up arguing a lot. Um, I, I guess I would put it this way. I, I would say that um, this is like Schelling's point. This is like the universe slumbering in a certain sense and now waking up to itself through conscious self-awareness. It's waking up to itself in a million different ways. This is just one way it's waking up to itself. So then the, this would be the proposal in, in light of what Nietzsche was saying to overcome the human. The proposal would be this, that the, the, the role of the human is um, to reflect upon, activate, and celebrate the universe. So you put it this way. The, the, um, the human is that mode in the universe through which the universe reflects upon, <coughs> activates, and celebrates itself. Now, uh, this, so then the idea isn't, I mean, this would be very different from what Nietzsche is saying, to overcome the human, but to try to connect it to what, say, Nietzsche is saying is, there is a momentum or there is a habit in the human that has led up to um, our situation today. And that momentum, that habit had to do with, you know, many years of evolutionary past, where it ends up being about accumulation. That habit has to be overcome so that we can actually enter more deeply into our role of beings that can't get over the magnificence in which they find themselves. So that, that's a, it's a proposal. And that, that goes very much along with what Pico was saying. So that we're, we're unfinished, um, not because we have to actually construct something beyond our nature. We're unfinished because we haven't yet released ourselves from um, cultural and even biological habits that constrain us, that hold us away from our true nature. Our true nature of <coughs> of um, entering deeply into stupor and um, celebrating <coughs> the glory in the midst of that. So what the, the question we have for it, here we're moving into uh, stage three of our talk, right? And that is, um, rather than argue with these ideas, we can do that forever, let's, let's, it's like an as-if, it's an as-if uh, proposal. What if the human is the way in which the universe awakens to its glory and its magnificence. What, what magnificence? What if that is our role? Now, in evolutionary theory, that as we enter more deeply into that role, the entire journey will change. And I was going to talk about that, but just leave it. What if, um, what if our role is actually to find a way um, more deeply into awe. That's our fundamental role. Now, the question, so uh, we're thinking of grouping up into threes and fours would be this question. Number one, it's two questions you get to choose. Number one is this. If, if that is the role of the human, something like that, and you took that seriously, how would that result in a different uh, lifestyle for you? So as we, as we awaken to the fact that we have been sold massively the, uh, the consumer lifestyle, the consumer mentality, the, the commodity, and all the rest of it. What if we awaken to a different point of view that our, our role is about uh, praise and glory and awe? How would that change, or how might that result in a different lifestyle? I just use that word, uh, a different you. Second question is this. If we took that role, uh, seriously, what, what would be the fundamental um, change in our institutions? Institutions like to define as um, um, stable answers to permanent questions. So we organize ourselves around these, these, these questions, how to organize um, child rearing and education and so forth. So anyway, that was our idea. and. Um, we thought it'd be a way to get everyone involved uh, creatively in this question of role of the human. How about groups of three and four? Are going to try this? Is that going to be the end of the collective discussion? Is that what you're saying? And then we'd come back together um, after the small groups and open up as a whole. But, but we could take uh, 
couple of you know, couple of minutes for uh, clarifications. Yeah, yeah. Question clarifications. Right. What about the light? The original title was cosmology of light. No, I mean oh. you're saying you're saying year is a variable. Yeah. Well, what about light? How fast are these galaxies moving away from the center? The explosion. How fast are they moving away? The speed of light? Okay. Um, because those are the kind of questions I can answer really well, the technical ones. Yeah. Yeah, okay. The deep ones, I because, hit the shot. Because okay. Einstein said, think, I thought maybe if, if time is a variable, then light might be a variable too, because Einstein said, you know, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, but now that's being challenged, right? Well, okay, I'll give you the, the news. Ready? Here it is. Okay. Um, <laughs> Hubble's constant. That's the great thing is, gives you how fast the galaxies are moving away. So, you take Hubble's constant and you multiply it by their distance from us. And then you find out it's around 75 kilometers per second per million light years. It's just a complicated number. But it, the further away the galaxy is, the faster it's moving away. It's linear. So, the ones that are this far away are moving 100 kilometers per second. The ones that are this far away are moving 200, see, and so forth. Now, as you notice, if it just grows in a linear fashion, eventually that speed will actually be greater than the speed of light. That's right. Okay. And that sounds like a contradiction with Einstein who said nothing goes faster than the speed of light. Einstein was talking about a particular reference frame. So this room could be a reference frame. In this room, nothing can move faster than the speed of light. We are talking about the entire universe. So it's the expansion of space and time. Now, we can't see those things that are going fast than the speed of light, obviously, because the light can't get to us. It's like if you're going you're on an escalator, you're on a down escalator, and you're walking up, <coughs> and you're walking up more slowly than the escalator is carrying you along. Right? You're going to be carried away. So, the, but. So right now, we can see out to 13 billion light years. And when you get out that far, they're going right near the speed of light. Now, there could be a beyond. Mm -hmm. exactly. And we imagine there is a beyond which is moving fast from the speed of light. So then the open question is, will we be able to see those galaxies as well? Right. If they are slowing down, which is a reasonable assumption, because when, you, when you, things are, you know, go apart, you know, they do slow down. If they are slowing down, eventually they'll slow down enough so the light will be able to escape and get to us, and we'll find out. We don't know. So these numbers really mean nothing. Because <laughs> 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 couldn't it mean that the universe is older than 13 billion years right. old? Right. Okay, no. Right. I see. So that, um, these numbers have to do with the observable universe. And the observable universe could be one bubble right. within an infinite number of bubbles. Right. But... Right. You know, we're trying to focus on what we can observe empirically, so we can say something about that. And if you want to speculate wildly, then what you do is you join the philosophy. <laughs> 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 uh, ten to the fortieth is when the universe stops being self-reflective. What's the next big thing that's going to happen, and at what, <laughs> at what level? Will it happen? Can, can we even speculate about that? Yeah, we can speculate about anything we want. <laughs> I'll tell you my speculation for what it's worth. All right. Uh, one, of the, one of the most fascinating questions in cosmology today has to do with the expansion. And so the question is simply this. Will it expand forever? Will it turn around collapse? Now, it is amazing that that's a question. Because if you, look at, if you look at the expansion of the universe and you simply measure it, it should be a very easy calculation. Unless the expansion is very near the critical point where you can't tell. Now that is also part of the anthropic principle. Mm -hmm. If the expansion were if, it were, if it were obvious that we're going to collapse, right? And here's the great thing. It would have collapsed billions of years ago. We wouldn't be here talking about it. Also, if it, were, if it were really obvious it was going to expand forever, there wouldn't have been galaxies. Mm -hmm. So well, the bizarre thing is, it is necessary for the universe to be at the critical rate of expansion. Now, to be at a critical rate means that the, that the law of large numbers breaks down, so that 
the isolated event, the individual, because you're at a critical state, could have an effect on the entire thing. So you can interpret it the way you want, but the way I interpret it is that the universe is expanding at critical rate and it hasn't made up its mind yet as to what it's going to do. So in terms of um, what's going to happen at 10 to the 41st and so <coughs> forth, obviously we don't know, but the, the part that really gives me up in the morning is this. It's possible the decisions we make will, will be part of that. Because one of the things for sure you learn when you look at the story of cosmic evolution is that it's impossible to assign uh, the word negligible. In the moment, you can look back and say what was negligible, but in the moment you can't decide what's negligible. All sorts of examples of that. So then could you say that the next big thing that happens after the universe becoming aware of itself is the universe taking control of itself? Mm -hmm. uh, having the ability to make decisions about itself. Hmm. Yeah, but the point is you can just say all kinds of things. I mean, I know, I, 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 mean, I think... <clears throat> well, we can say them. Well, I mean, but I think what David is suggesting is it's just extrapolating from what you're, you're, you're yeah, that's laying out right. here. Because basically consciousness, this means that consciousness is not this passive observer of what's going to happen whether it's going to end in fire or whether it's going to end in, in ice, that there's something singular about this emergence of consciousness and just the very fact that you have consciousness changes the whole ball game. That it's going to have, just being conscious of the fact that it's the universe, that this is the nature of the universe, in some sense changes it teleologically, it seems to me. I well, think I, I certainly agree that, that yeah, the, but if it, whether it leads to control is certainly if there's. I'm, I'm trying to in, introduce the idea of possible massive influence. Rick, I think you're pointing to when you use terms like we've come to this point where we need to make this this species uniquely needs to make a change, a fundamental change beyond habits that are constraining it or else there are major consequences that will come uh, as a result. That all points to me to a dimension that scientists don't generally talk about, but I think we do need to address, and that is that there's a, a moral dimension to the next step, that everything that has brought us to this point it, and has brought us to a, an awakening of the cosmos, a self-reflexive a reflective consciousness. It's not just a cognitive step that needs to be taken. It's not like an engineering problem that needs to be addressed. There's actually going, to, there has to be some moral uh, transformation that takes place. And that suggests that the cosmos has built into it a moral dimension. Moral dimensions don't come out of, you know, uh, nothing because if it's in us then it's in the universe because we are the universe and it therefore could be that the cosmos is anthropocentric in a certain way in the sense that the human being is and this is how I would define a, a human being at least in part it's not only the celebrating part and this um, you know, self-reflective part. It's also that part that that has uh, the possibility of of moral and immoral action, and that's a whole new um, context for looking at the cosmic experiment. And I think it's one that we have to address in our moment in time, in a way that we never had to address before. Yeah, the three words that, that I use are reflect upon, activate and celebrate. In other words, the universe is, uh, this is, is, is wanting to reflect upon itself, to activate itself, and to celebrate itself through the human mode. Linda, and then Kim, and then Robert, and then we'll go into some creative discussions. Sean set this up by taking a strong uh, anthropic principle as his position and saying that, or suggesting that you would argue with that. But what I'm hearing you talking about is also an anthropic principle here, too. So where do you two disagree? 
other than the science versus philosophy banter. That was the entertainment part of the celebration. <laughs> well, John? Well, the more I hear uh, Brian speak, the more I realize I, I don't disagree with, with him. I mean, there, there are fine well, points. Wait, well, wait, 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 but define the weak okay. and the strong, and then soon you can want, you'll be weak and you'll be the strong and Because what I hear you saying I is that strong. the universe was <laughs> aiming toward us. And what I hear Brian saying is, we're here at a moment, and it's our job to basically celebrate it because we've got the gift. So it's the weak, the, the weak and the strong and tropic. Well, he, but Sean defined a human in a very vast way. Well, he also conflated anthropocentric with anthropic, which is not quite the same. But I mean, when you when you talk about human, right? mm -hmm. so I, I I use the phrase conscious self awareness, right? and that's sort of like what you mean by human, right? Mm -hmm. or, yeah. Uh, but I, I agree with, with Rick that it's not just a cognitive thing. The, the sapiens or the wisdom, right? Uh, Homo sapiens. What is the wisdom? Well, the wisdom is, it's, is the, the true, uh, the beautiful, and the good. Right? So it's the true, it's, it's self reflective consciousness, it's the beautiful, it's awe, but it's also the good. Uh, it's value, uh, responsibility, compassion, so, compassion sensitivity love, to the whole, yeah, uh, empathy. But I, I think that's so that that is the fully human to me. These um, the the actualization of your your the three uh, principles that you you uh, mentioned, or the good, the true, and the beautiful, or wisdom and love, wisdom and compassion. Uh, that is the human form divine. Great. That's what I mean. Human and wrong. Um. I don't know much about it, but I'll just bring it up. Um, dark matter and the potential of dark matter for changing um, the future of the universe. Um, it's attracting me because it's dark. <laughs> 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 and invisible and relatively unknown. And um, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on this in terms, is it too speculative? I mean. <laughs> Well, the dark matter. Dark energy, too. Don't forget dark, dark energy. Dark energy. Yeah, dark matter, dark energy. Uh, they're, you know, they're not speculative. We, we know for sure they exist. We haven't been able to interact with it. But um, clearly, it, when I talk about the long-term destiny of the universe, it's going to be determined primarily by dark matter, because there's so much of it. Like 90% of the universe is dark matter. So. Uh, it's hard to kind of speculate further because we haven't um, so, and just interacted with three it. Three words or less. What's dark matter? Like, not, yeah. not, is dark, dark matter is is matter. Uh, I mean, three words. <laughs> okay, it's a plug number. So it's matter it is dark. You know? <laughs> so it doesn't radiate or reflect. No, it gives off no light, and so it, we only we can only detect it by its gravitational effects. So it's a plug number. <clears throat> It's a plug number. What's a plug number? It's a plug number. It's it's a number you need to finish an equation. It's like the fudge. Fudge. A fudge. A fudge. Yeah. That's right. Fudge. Fudge. It's a fudge factor. Here's the, I would interpret this. You look at like the Milky Way galaxy, and they have globular clusters. So you, have, you have all this. You know, it's like a big giant uh, pancake. And then they have these globular clusters that are going around like this, and they go down in <coughs> the Milky Way and through and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, you can calculate their speed by the look at the mass of the Milky Way galaxy. But the problem is that even when you go out, the way outside of the, the luminous part of the galaxy, they don't drop off in speed. So we know that there's, there's some form of matter that surrounds the entire Milky Way galaxy that doesn't give off light. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's enabling these um, galaxies to... It's sort of a subtle body. Right. So it's like unmanifested? It's, like <coughs> it's, it's manifesting. It's manifesting in terms of gravitational interaction. But not in terms of electromagnetic. Or matter. It's given off no, no, in terms of matter. So the baryons, it's, it's pro, you think it's pro, it's, it's made up of. People have th different theories. Um, it could, could be um, a number of different things. Josefina will give a, a little moment and then we're going to finish up with Robert. Okay. Well, I, I still need, you know, I'm still a little confused here between the two uh, definitions of, you know, of, we're talking of self aware consciousness as the awakening of the universe, you're talking of uh, consciousness through the human, 
My question is, what happens at this point? We know that there are other species in the world that are moving up in 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 their in their uh, in, in the hierarchy, let me put it that way, of consciousness. We uh, now understand that the, some species of apes have a consciousness that is beyond what we believe they had. So obviously this awakening of consciousness is not happening only in the human. Maybe, maybe the human is ahead in the self-awareness department, but maybe consciousness is happening, is, uh, is, is Maybe the universe is awakening in many ready. You know? So um, how we, why, can we, can we focus on the human as pure, I mean, just the human species as that self-awakening of the universe? Or can we think that maybe it's going to happen if the human species may disappear tomorrow for some strange reason? Maybe in another billion years, it would be another species that would be the sex that, that yeah. Well, you know, my, uh, my position here is, it's, it's just easy to say, it's that the, every, every mode of the universe is celebrating the universe. You know, so sea urchins, they're celebrating the universe. Our way is, is involves conscious self-awareness. And the, and the reason it sounds so wonderful is that we're so in love with ourselves. It's just another way to celebrate being. I, I don't regard it as above. Maybe we differ, differ on that, but I don't want to go down that path. Because I, I just want to turn it over to the group, but I mean it is a possibility. I think that just I think walnuts celebrate the universe magnificently by being walnuts. Like God, look at them, you know. And so that we 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 process it through conscious awareness. So what? Yeah, but you know, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and we do walnuts go. Wow, look at those humans. Right. Oh, but they exactly. produce these awesome nuts. I mean, do you do that? <laughs> What's more important, we go, wow, or a nut? <laughs> you know? In terms of the universe, I mean, I mean they're both important. The oh, well, of course, course they're important. Well, you know, but just the fact that a woman can't do what we do, it, you know, we can't do it. Now, so now, we're, now we're starting to polarize here. But Brian, you said that, that um, <coughs> it's not self-awareness or consciousness of, I don't know, could be maybe another of the forces. I never said that. Oh, okay, somebody said it here that could be a force in the universe that's 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 happening, that's emerging. Well, clearly, it's, yes, it's emerging. Okay. The yes. fifth force. Uh, so that's no, but see, I don't, no, no, just stop. <laughs> I see. I to me, consciousness is is a is a mode of the universe. It isn't something that distinguishes the human. That's what I'm okay. That's okay. What I'm okay. I agree completely okay. with you. So the idea of like a, a consciousness being another force, or I just hate that perspective because it. It, it, right away, it just it, it fits right into what I think is driving consumerism. You see, we we're out here. We have this consciousness, so we get this stuff, and so rather than rather than joining the chorus of consciousness, we think we're getting material. So that, that might be a difference too. Robert, save us! We want to move to creative discussion. So you get the last word. I feel a little bit like the student who waits till the lecture's over and the questions are over and then asks the question and face the professor. I have to say the whole thing all over again. <laughs> um, so if that's what I'm doing, uh, just say so and move on. Uh, but somewhere along the line, the topic got transformed. And whereas we thought it was going to be who is and who isn't anthropocentric, it got slightly... Um, shifted in focus in an interesting good way I'm not unhappy but I'm trying to find out I think Sean is still where at least some of us expected him to be but your position either is more, some slight, slightly more complicated, nuanced or something I'm, I'm trying to find out what words we would use and what words do you want to use so that you don't uh, leave us with the idea that we that it's this or that response to anthropocentric, but rather something slightly different, so that the question gets transformed into a new way of talking. Somewhere between you know ten to the 39th, ten to the fortieth, we had this transition that you recount. Now there's going to be a movement past that. The human is obviously going to have a lot to say about that. 
having to do with knowledge and wisdom, such as Sean articulated, how is your position, if not anthropocentric, which doesn't seem to be a thing you want to be, what other words could you use? Um, heterarchy. I would use heterarchy. I think that's my position. Okay. And usually when you think of anthropocentrism, right. you think in terms of, of a single value hierarchy, right. often. And so it's human and you know, stones. Right. So my, my position is that, that everything is, is, is at the very pinnacle of a particular hierarchy. And that all of them together make up the universe. And then, okay, okay. That's helpful. Thanks. Why not go into groups of three or four? The, of the apparent conflict between the two of you. A resolution for Rick. There is a book, Progress and Philosophy. Conjunctio. Um, you know, uh, I know that you, uh, the question is anthropocentrism. And I know that you. You know, private information. Brian, <laughs> believe in that our universe is an omnicentric universe. This is not any you know, unique thing to you. I mean, we, we, that's our cosmology now. We live in an omnicentric universe. There's no, uh, you know, the Earth's not the center, the sun's not the center, the gal our galaxy's not the center. It's not that we live in a universe without a center, though, as you beautifully have you know, elaborated in Hidden Heart of the uh, Cosmos and elsewhere. Uh, we live in an omnicentric universe. Therefore, we live in an anthropocentric universe. We do not live in a universe in which the human being is the only center, but we do live in an anthropocentric universe. And if the human being is, in fact, a cosmic center, and it's the nature of the human being to be self-reflective, uh, morally uh, autonomous and responsible, uh, and focused on beauty and the potential uh, of celebrating the cosmos, then those qualities are, in fact, absolutely uh, intended by the cosmos all along and uh, are, are part of our, it, it's, a, it's an anthropocentric universe. And all those qualities are extremely important if, in fact, they go awry and our destructiveness becomes, you know, ecologically, cosmologically non-negligible, as you pointed out, then the anthropocentrism of the universe has um, significance. It's not a trivial thing. It has significance, that, that centric dimension. So anyway. Nice. That's good. So it's also a slug-centric. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. No, it's, it's a walnut-centric universe. Yeah. You know, Dewey Main, a Confucian scholar, the word he uses is anthropocosmic. Mm. It's kind of nice. Yeah. You say that again? Anthropocosmic. Anthropocosmic. Well, great. So, what we'd like to do is to have you um, maybe elect a person from each group and then carefully um, review and summarize all that you said. <laughs> In eight minutes. And then I'll put up the Chinese character for crisis. <laughs> And explain that it also means I mean, elect our elect opportunity. <laughs> Nancy! You had your hand up. No, I was stretching. I was stretching. <laughs> John, yeah, we'll, we'll start. I'll, 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 I'll speak for, You're taking this seriously? For, for our group. You know, I was kidding. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can say anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know you were kidding. He's graduated from the philosophy department, so he's yeah. already, he knows it all. Now. I just, John, you are free to say whatever you want. Well, you exercise yourself as a sexual being. That's good. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> no. In our group, um, we talked about what we could do personally to to move from um, 
a species-centered to a more earth-centered wisdom, which would be um, to be aware of how, to try to be as, as aware as possible of, of the ways that we impact the whole and trying to care for the whole as much as possible. And then the issue came up um, of, of how difficult it is as individuals and the institutional, um, the institutional inertia and, and the huge forces of, of institutions and, and how to and how to so so the conversation went into into that side so we went directly from the personal to the institutional and and, and that's where our conversation sort of orbited is, is how do we as individuals how do we as individuals joining together in political action or you know we brought in um, the work of, of Thomas Berry and Joanna Macy the holding actions changing actions and creating new institutions Actually, that's good. That's good. Thank you. David. David. I got confused because <laughs> the um, path of, the, of your talk, Brian, not Sean, um, what, most of it was, in, it seemed to me, saying <clears throat> that what is happening at 10 to the 40th, whatever those units of time are, what, what is happening is the emergence of self reflection. That is the event. The only walnuts are not self-reflective. Mm -hmm. Humans are, and so there seems to be, and not just a quantitative difference, <coughs> but an ontological qualitative difference between the human, defined as that which is self-reflective, and walnuts. So it's not a walnut-centric universe. The universe has not been aiming at walnuts according to what you said in, in most of your talk. So I detected a, a, a shift, uh, an incongruence there that, that confused me. Yeah, well, OK. Well, well, uh, uh, shell game. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it. <laughs> oh, Safina, you went jumping here. Well, uh, <laughs> the universe is not uh, is not um, Going towards walnut uh, awareness, but it's, I think it's, it's, it's. They're uh, probably laughing to themselves. Did the wine get past? <laughs> Not yet. Uh, the, the, I think it's, it's, uh, the universe. It's, it's aware of itself, I mean, let me put it this way, it it's, comes to be through experience of all kinds, I mean, the walnut experience, the urchin experience, the muscle experience. But there's a plasma experience I mean, at 10 to the 10. Well, no, but I mean, yeah, <laughs> but up, up amongst all these different types of experiences, there is one mode of experiences that experience that self-awareness. So it's it's just another language. It's like if if you can put it in a, as a metaphor, it's like the human body. There are different cells which we which are constituting this the human body, and each of these cells is experiencing something, maybe in an unconscious way. But there are particular there's the mind in in the human, which is that part of the human that has self awareness. That doesn't mean that the body um, is just centered in in the mind. The body is the whole thing. So it's <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's why it, it's uh, it's. I I I would sustain that the universe is well centric to well not centric to. I mean. If, if we talk of omnicentric universe, the universe is walnut centric and is uh, uh, human uh, anthropocentric. And if you talk of an omnicentric yeah. universe, yes, but the, the whole thrust of Brian's talk was that what's happening at this moment has nothing to do with walnuts, but has to do with those. Okay, all right, yeah. so okay. Like you want the next level. Okay. Um, I gave an interpretation of 10 to 40 as being uh, the moment when the universe becomes self-aware. Um, I was careful not to say the moment when humans arrive. 
Okay, so that it is. Um, you know, we we inevitably are Cartesian. We we just we just think in terms of of conscious self awareness <coughs> as being um, inside <coughs> inside of us. It's just it's hard not, it's hard to avoid it. <coughs> but in fact, when you think about it for a while, you you realize that that. Conscious self-awareness requires the whole interconnected web of the Earth community. So it's it's trying to get at the idea that conscious self-awareness is a mode of the universe, as opposed to being a capacity of a particular species. So I was talking about it that way, and we <coughs> enable we beings of the universe enable conscious self-awareness to arise. We also enable photosynthesis to arise, a whole bunch of other things. Uh, if I were given this talk as a sea urchin, it'd be different. But I, I just I just mean I'm focused on conscious self-awareness because that's, that's one of the particular challenges of our time. But I don't think of it. I really don't think of it as something the human owns or even does. It's something that's done to the human by the universe. And so we are, we witness it, we experience it, Okay, that's just my response. Lots more can be said. Uh, Barry had his hand up, then Robert, then I saw something over here. It's Drew? It's yeah. all right. <laughs> oh, God, Sean. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Hold it. The man who doesn't believe in hierarchy turns <laughs> uh, Come on. No, no, seriously, I, I, get, I get to talk to you um, much more than... So how do we go? So it's it's Barry, it's Robert, and then... And Drew. Well, my mind kind of adds on there, I just want to, so I want to stick it in real quick and jump on the stack. In the sense that, what I, if I'm hearing what you're saying, you're talking about the universe having to unfold its complexity to a degree that it can generate brains, organisms, nervous systems of a complexity highly organized enough to allow the mode of conscious self-awareness that's inherent or implicit in the universe, in the galaxies, in the flaring forth, in the first generation stars from the beginning so that but it takes a certain degree of evolution of complexity to create a dolphin's brain a gorilla's brain a human's brain this kind of central nervous system in which conscious self-awareness of inherent in the universe can blossom into self-reflexive awareness of itself is that what you're saying yeah and so it's not a human not brain. as well as that yeah. it, it could be going on in dolphins and gorillas and it could be going on in like amoeba-like blobs in, in some Star Trek realm on another planet, but it's a certain degree of complexity that happens to coincide with this 10 to the 40th amount of evolution, that then that mode of the universe can be manifest. That's great. That's right. And then, all I'm saying, that is the sapiens. That's, that is sapiens. Homo sapiens, what, we, what you just described, that event, that is sapiens. So mm -hmm. if, if amoebas are human, they're human. Mm -hmm. That's all I'll say. And then went to Barry and then Robert. Yes, Brian. Um, it seemed to me, if you will repeat what you said at the beginning of the lecture about why humans were created to give celebration to what, would you say that again? Um, human is that mode through which the universe reflects upon, activates, and celebrates mm -hmm. itself in conscious self awareness. Okay. I'm wondering if you really have to have the dichotomy that, that you're setting up between the universe doing this and something, as David's argument, and something in, in, the, in the human. It seems to me that you're almost giving uh, aid and comfort to uh, David's position and my position by saying what you said, because it just seems like an extrapolation to then say, well, then, yes, snails, yes, um, uh, um, starfish, urchins are conscious, but they're conscious through us, and maybe our role as humans is to add some sort of conscious, self-conscious dimension as we acknowledge their being and understand their being. We add some sort of pool of self-reflection that lifts them to a symbiosis in consciousness self-reflective consciousness with us. So, um, uh, but I, I, I still think that, that, that there is, you're right, there, there seems to be a matrix that, of consciousness and, 
And, but I, I think that matrix, matrix is centered, of the, I shouldn't say conscious, it's self-conscious in, in, the, in the human psyche. Um, is how, is, how is you then, the, uh, let me put it in the form of a question. How is your phrase about why human beings are uh, created to self-protect the universe? Why, why can't, why does that not, why does that exclude Chan's position and David's position? Well, <clears throat> it transcends and includes That's what you learn. That's what you learn in the philosophy department. <laughs> as I stated at the beginning of the, the talk, it seemed to be viable to me. But now, <laughs> now I'm really conscious of something new. I'm conscious that I'm in the bedroom of a lot of people in this room. <laughs> and it's past 10 o'clock at night. How do you get rid of that gas that just keeps talking and talking, you know? That's what I'm thinking about up here right now. We'll throw you out tomorrow. <laughs> um, I think my position is, is actually very similar to Sean's. And uh, David and I got to talk a little more um, before I convinced him that his is similar to mine. <laughs> but before we really found out where, the, where our differences are and sort of similarities, I think it's too quick to sort of say. But Sean, now I, I feel like it's almost identical, unfortunately, because that means one of us is not needed. <laughs> That's a Thomas Perry line. Robert. I, I will forego if nobody else goes. No, come on. Is that a deal? No, no, no. Is it a deal? It's a deal. Okay, it's a deal. We're good. All right. That, that was heroic self-sacrifice. <laughs> We have to leave this up and dream because you're meditating.